Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Thursday, March 31st, 2022, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right, so we have a lot to talk about on today's show. You know, yesterday's show, we did an update on what's going on with uh, Will Smith and the uh, Screen Actor in the uh, Academy, the Screen Actors Academy, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And we talked about um, a <clears throat> investigation has been launched and the academy in a statement on wednesday said that his board of governors have begun the process of disciplining will smith for inappropriate physical contact abusive or threatening behavior and compromising the integrity of the academy so some more information came out today we're going to give you an update on what's taking place with that and there was a good so there were two articles they came out this morning from TMZ. The articles are kind of conflicting. We'll break that down. But there's also um, also what came out today. Uh, Academy leaders and Will Smith discussed Oscars slap before emergency board meeting. And also Will Packer. Who produced the Oscars. Will Packer is going to do an exclusive interview with Good Morning America on friday morning 7 a.m eastern standard time so we're, we're going to talk about this today and um then we'll discuss this some more on our sunday show okay and try to separate fact from fiction now there was a um story dealing with uh, the reparations task force out of uh, california you may have seen this story um, I saw the I saw the article from the New York Times as well as the griot.com. Uh, California task force votes to offer reparations only to uh, descendants of enslaved people. California task force votes to opt to offer reparations only to descendants of enslaved people. We're going to talk about this. We, we've heard about the uh, effort to get um, reparations for uh, African-Americans, uh, descend descendants of free and enslaved uh, African-Americans in California. And what's strange is California really does not have a history of slavery because California came into the Union in 1850 as a free state. There is some evidence of about 1,500 people or so being enslaved in California. But we're going to talk about this because the task force in how they're deciding who gets what is causing a little controversy. The vote Tuesday uh, was a 5-4 split. The vote, so so they took the vote on Tuesday. This It's a... Uh, nine person committee and the vote Tuesday split five, four and the hours long debate was at times testy and emotional. Okay. So we're going to uh, give you some information on what happened there. We see efforts to deal with uh, the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow segregation and racism. We see this, uh, taking place in different cities across the country while we wait on, while we continue to push for reparations at the national level, there are steps that states are making and, and cities are making also, okay? So we'll talk about this uh, as well. There was an article from the Associated Press that, um, there's a piece from the Associated Press that, uh, thegrio.com picked up we're going to also look at the article from new york times because they have less ad, ad, less ads popping up on me 
California panel okays reparations limit for slave descendants. And today on Roland Martin Unfiltered, Roland interviewed the uh, person, Camila Moore, who's the chair, the chairperson of this task force also. So we'll talk about uh, reparations in California. We'll talk a little bit about the history in California, the, 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 the little known story of how slavery infiltrated California and the American West, even though um, when California became a state in the union, uh, it came in as a free state. And also, did you know that at one point, California tried to ban all African-Americans also. California tried to ban all African-Americans as well, all free African-Americans. So we'll talk about this. We'll give you an update on what's going on with Will Smith, Chris Rock, um, and the fallout from what happened at, at the Oscars as well. Um, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, this corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or a woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do it, teach what it doesn't know. I was at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History today. So some people are watching the video that I did. Um, so um, I went to go see the King Tut exhibit at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. But also when you walk into the rotunda, there is uh, a display dealing with the Underground Railroad, okay? So I, I did a video in, in talking about the history of the Underground Railroad, things like that. It's on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Um, I need to upload this to YouTube. People are watching it. People have been watching it and um, breaking down history also. So check that out. And it's on uh, my personal Facebook page as well. All right. So you can check that out. Okay. Um, Calling numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a question or comment. So I want to go to this first story here, and this is dealing with um, uh, reparations in, in California. And I'm also going to play a segment from Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'll be back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. I'm a panelist each Friday, okay? Uh, so th this piece here from the Associated Press picked up by uh, the griot.com is from uh, March 30th, 2022, Wednesday, March 30th, 2022, California panel okays reparations limit for slave descendants. California panel okays reparations limit for slave descendants. Um, California's, uh, California's first in the nation task force on reparations has decided to limit, uh, compensation, limit state compensation to the descendants of free people and enslaved people who were in the U S in the 19th century, who were in the U S in the 19th century. Now they're going to have to tweak how they're determining who gets the compensation because 19th century okay so you're talking about 1800 basically 1800 to 1899 if somebody came in 1900 they wouldn't qualify but if they came in 1899 if their ancestors came in 1899 they would qualify but if their ancestors came in 1900 they wouldn't qualify but black people who were in the u.s in the 19th century Nar narrowly rejecting a proposal to include all black people regardless of lineage regardless of uh, rejecting a proposal to include all black people regardless of lineage the vote tuesday split five four and the hours long debate was at times testy and emotional near the end the reverend amos brown president of the San Francisco branch of the NAACP and vice chair of the task force pleaded with the commission to move ahead with a clear definition of who would be eligible for restitution. Now we're going to continue this on the other side of the break. 
And we'll also let you know about the online class that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays, online history classes. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me. and She's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Thursday, March 31st, 2022, and we are live. All right, so in a few minutes, we'll give you an update on what's going on with Will Smith, Chris Rock, uh, Will Packer, um, and also the Academy, um, the Oscars. Uh, I want to go back to this story here. We're going to clip one in just a minute, Shakita from ABC Channel 10 out of California. So right before the break, we were talking about what happened in California. Uh, this vote took place on Tuesday, uh, which was uh, March 29th. And the uh, California Task Force uh, for Reparations voted 5-4 to, let me go back to this. They voted 5-4 to... Um, decide to limit compensation for slavery to descendants of free and enslaved people who were in the U.S. in the 19th century, okay? Now, the vote uh, the vote on Tuesday split 5-4, and the hours-long debate was at times testy and emotional. Near the end, the Reverend Amos Brown, president of the San Francisco branch of the NAACP, and vice chair of the task force pleaded with the commission to move ahead with a clear definition, a clear definition of who would be eligible for restitution. All right. He said, please, please, please. I beg us tonight. Take the first step. He said, we've got to give emergency treatment to where it is needed. We've got to give emergency treatment to where it is needed. All right, now, uh, now Governor Gavin Newsom, governor of California, signed legislation creating the two-year reparations uh, task force in 2020, making California the only state to move ahead with a study and plan, the only state to move ahead with a study and plan with a mission to study the institution of slavery and its harms and to educate the public about its findings, okay? Now, reparations efforts at the federal level have gone, what, what the, they haven't passed the House. They have about 196 co-sponsors in the House, is probably the most they've ever had on H.R. 40. It passed out of the um, House Judiciary Committee for the first time, in something like 39 years in April 2021. And it takes 218 votes to get any bill passed in the House of Representatives. So they're trying to get enough votes so they so so the uh they can go to the floor for a vote, they can go to the general floor for a vote, and then once it passes the House, then it will go to the Senate. It's dead on arrival in the Senate until you get uh 
55 Democrats in the Senate who support it. And then you can change the filibuster rule also and get that bill passed in the Senate. So unfortunately, a lot of people talking about reparations don't know the process to, to get what they want passed. But reparations efforts at the federal level have not go, uh, so are stalled, uh, are not going as fast as they should. But cities and universities are taking up the issue. The mayor of Providence, Rhode Island, announced a city commission in February 2022, while the city of Boston is considering uh, a proposal to form its own reparations commission. The city of Boston is considering a proposal to form its own reparations commission. Now, at the same time that people are, that people are talking about reparations, you have to understand America must have a massive history lesson because Americans are very, very ignorant of history. Amer all across the country, regardless of race or ethnicity, Americans are very ignorant of history. So America must have a massive history lesson as well. OK, and as you have an increase in attacks on uh, these uh, critical race theory, the, these anti critical race theory laws, you have Republicans who are trying to suppress the teaching of the, a, the teaching of a history that will lead you to understanding and take you throughout history and show how these structural inequities were created in the maldistribution of wealth, power, and resources, things like this. So we're trying to get reparations bills passed and have task force, things like this, at a time when you have a huge backlash to teaching this type of history. Okay, so we have to understand this and, and keep in mind, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources in the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Okay, politics impacts every aspect of our lives, from the water we drink to the air we breathe to the food we eat. Okay, so if we go back to this, we're going to clip one in just a second. Now, the Chicago suburb of Evanston, Illinois, became the first U.S. city to make reparations available to African-American residents in 2021. All some say the program has 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 done nothing to right a wrong. OK, I don't know who wrote this, but the, the see that the reparations program in Evanston, Illinois. Was spearheaded by Robin Rue Simmons. Robin Rue Simmons was on the city council at the time. I interviewed Robin Rue Simmons on this show for an hour. That interview, just like all these other interviews I've done and all these other shows I've done are archived. You can go back and watch it. The African History Network on Facebook and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube and uh, Blog Talk Radio, the African History Network show on blogtalkradio.com. The African History Network show on iHeartRadio, one of 10 different audio, podca audio podcast platforms. The reparations that they had in Evanston, Illinois, was focused on redlining. Okay, redlining housing discrimination. So you had a lot of people who were criticizing them, saying this isn't about slavery, this is about redlining. Okay. Well, the problem is they ain't study history. As we broke down in my interview with Robin Rue Simmons, who was the councilwoman who was on city council at the time in Evanston, Illinois. Evanston, Illinois was founded in the 1840s. The state of Illinois abolished slavery in 1818. Evanston, Illinois is a city of 60,000 people. 16% African American. Evanston, Illinois does not have a history of slavery, but Evanston, Illinois has a rampant history of how uh, of redlining. Evanston, Illinois has a rampant history of redlining, and some of the victims of redlining who are African American are still alive in Evanston, Illinois. That's why they ain't deal with slavery because they don't have a history of slavery in Evanston, but they do have a rampant history of redlining. Okay, so, and I also read a lot of the 70 page study that their commission in Evanston did that their, that their uh, 
policy that they created uh, was based upon. Okay. Now, California's task force members, nearly all of whom can trace their families back to enslaved ancestors in the U.S., were aware that their deliberations over a pivotal question will shape reparations discussions across the country. Let's go to this clip. This is from ABC Channel 10 out of uh, California talking about uh, this vote that took place. California's Reparation Task Force has made a big decision. Last night it held a vote on who is eligible for compensation, and the results were close. ABC 10's Monica Coleman joins us now. So, Monica, where does the group stand this morning? Well, the nine-member task force, by a five-to-four vote, decided reparations will be limited to the descendants of enslaved people. ABC 10 spoke to Camilla Moore, chairperson of the task force, to find out why they decided to base the payments on lineage and not race. Going against the argument, all black people, regardless of lineage, deserve reparations because of systematic racism in housing, education, and employment. Lineage matters. When we're talking about reparations for the institution of slavery, we're talking about a particular group of people and a particular crime against humanity, um, that being the institution of slavery as it was enacted and constructed in the United States. The task force also opened eligibility to freed black people who came to the country in the 19th century due to it may be difficult to prove the bloodline of the time one was enslaved. When it comes to compensation, it could be in the form of free college, assistance buying a home, or launching businesses and grants to churches, but the task force has not voted on a concrete plan. So, Monica, what are the next steps with this? So, Bria, there's a lot of questions still, right? So there will be another meeting today. We'll be following up on that because the task force still needs to talk about how they are going to get reparations out to the people who are eligible and furthering this onward. Mm, I can think of a lot of questions that come along with it, but hopefully we'll have some answers on that in the coming meeting. Monica, thank you. Okay, great reporter for Monica for uh, ABC Channel 10 um, in California. Also, check out this article from the New York Times. California task force votes to offer reparations only to descendants of enslaved people. Uh, this is from March 30th, 2022, uh, Wednesday, March 30th, 2022, New York times We're coming up on a break. When we come back from the break, I'm gonna let you hear an excerpt of, uh, the interview Roland Martin did with Camila Moore. You heard Camila Moore, who is the chairperson of the, uh, California, uh, reparations task force. Uh, she was on Roller Martin Unfiltered today, and I'll let you hear an excerpt of that, and then we'll give you an update on what's going on with Will Smith, Chris Rock, Will Packer, producer Will, Will Packer, and uh, the Oscars. You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995 and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008 and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, the Business of Beings was released in December 2021 and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis' books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself 
and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome, welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. All right. Um, I want to go to, let's see, we're going to go to clip number two from Roland Martin and Filtered in just a minute, uh, Shakita. So cue that up, please. Uh, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay. So uh, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Also, we have the information right on the home page uh, uh, of the website. And we have uh, the Cash App information as well as uh, PayPal. This is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. When you go to it, it says Michael, it shows my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network Cash App accounts that's that's not uh and we have the uh cash app link here also in the PayPal button as well uh you can register for the online classes i teach on saturdays and sundays on saturdays is ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school and sundays is from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 okay so i want to go uh Check out this article here. I want to go back to this topic dealing with reparations, the reparations task force in California. Uh voted five four to uh limit compensation for reparations uh from the state of California to the descendants of free and enslaved people who were in the US in the 19th century. So California doesn't have a big history of slavery like other states. California comes into the Union in um, 1850 because of the Compromise of 1850. And um, California was part of Mexico because of the uh, because of um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which ends the Mexican-American War. The U.S. is going to get California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Nevada from uh, Mexico for fifteen million dollars. Then the Missouri, then the Compromise of eighteen fifty organized the organizes the territory that the U.S. gets from Mexico, and and um, California is going to come into the Union as a free state in eighteen fifty. Now they're going to try to ban. There's a period of time where they try to ban all free african americans we know 1849 uh peter burnett i think his name was was the first governor he's a white supremacist first governor of california uh there's a piece here we talked about this in my online class um when california uh, once tried to ban all black people okay california once tried to ban all black people if we look at this uh article quickly here from history.com California once tried to ban uh, black people. The new state's leaders banned slavery, but tried to kick free black people out. The new, the new state's leaders banned slavery, but tried to kick free black people out. When Peter Burnett took to the podium in Sacramento in 1849, he faced a group of men like him, pioneers determined to take California from an upstart territory to a full-fledged state. He had been elected California's first governor just days before, and as he addressed his fellow legislators, he brought up one of the most explosive issues of the time, the place of black people in the future state, the place of African-Americans in the future state. California had to ban slavery after a heated debate, but uh, Peter Burnett's vision did not include African-American residents at all. 
quote, it could be no, it could be no favor and no kindness to permit free blacks to settle in the state, he said. Quote, while it would be a most serious injury to, to us had they been born here and had acquired uh, rights in consequence, I should not recommend any measures to expel them. I should not recommend any measures to expel them. The object is to keep them out. So the object was to ban all African Americans and come out as opposed to trying to expel them. They didn't want that. They wanted to ban them. Now, Peter Burnett was not alone in his vision. Throughout the 1840s and 1850s, California citizens and legislators fought to ensure that free uh, African Americans would be prohibited from emigrating to or living in California. And though their efforts eventually failed, and though their efforts eventually failed, they reflected the fear and racism faced by African-Americans in the American West. Now, we also know that uh, Los Angeles, California, half the families that founded Los Angeles, California, were Afro-Mexicans uh, 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 as well. OK, now I want to go to face to face Africa dot com uh, has an article on that. OK, I, I want to go to uh, this clip here from uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered today. He spoke with uh, Camila Moore, who's the chair of the uh, California Reparations Task Force. Let's go to this clip, Shakita. California's first in the nation statewide task force on reparations voted to limit state compensation in the event it's awarded to the descendants of free and enslaved black people in the United States in the 19th century. This decision rejects the proposal to include all black people who would receive reparations. Camila Moore, she is the California Reparations Task Force Chair. She joins us from Los Angeles to explain this decision. Camila, glad to have you here. Um, first and foremost, uh, there was a lot of people who talked on this issue. Dr. Greg Carr was one of the folks who participated uh, in this hearing. Um, how many folks did, did y'all count who actually testified uh, in this matter on Tuesday? 11 people testified. So six of those 11 people were certified genealogists. Uh, two were Greg Carr and Jessica Ann Iwar, and the other three were Marcus Champion, who's a grassroots organizer in California and worked on AB 3121 before it was enacted. Mike Davis, who's a former assembly member in the state of California and advocated for a lineage standard and then lastly, Kevin Brown, who um, is an Evanston resident and, and spoke against a bit about what's going on with the, re the reparations program in Evanston. So the vote ended up being five to four. Uh, so, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a very close vote. Um, what, was the re what was the issue? Why was it so contentious? Great question. So the community of eligibility discussion and debate has been kind of looming over the nine member task force since we first started meeting as early as June of 2021. So we've been having a 10 month debate around eligibility and the crux of the issue is, or was, um, should the eligibility standard be defined by a race based standard? So as you said in your introduction, all black Californians being eligible for, for compensation for reparations for the institution of slavery, or should it be based on a lineage standard where if you can trace your ancestry to what we decided on, an African-American descendant of a chattel enslaved person or the descendant of a free black person living in the United States prior to the end of the 19th century, then you would be eligible. And so ultimately five people on the task force uh, voted for the lineage-based standard and four voted for a race-based standard. So, so based upon that, if, some, if somebody black came to the United States in 1899, they make the cut. If they came, uh, if they came in 1900, they don't make the cut. Potentially, potentially, we still have to work all those details out. But that's what it says. So how? So now here's the issue: How being a people? How are you going to prove it? How will people be able to trace it? Because what we know is, you don't necessarily have clearly defined records. For people to be able to search their lineage, 
So how are you going to do it? So that's a really great, great question. But first, before I answer that question, I think that oftentimes people don't ask the same question about how do you prove your blackness, right? Um, and how do you measure blackness? How do you prove it? So what's to stop someone like a Rachel Dolezal or Mindy Kaling's brother, who's of Indian descent, who actually wrote a book about how he pretended to be black to get into medical school, how do you um, determine who's black and why would we be comfortable with the state making those particular determinations? But in or to answer your question about lineage tracing, um, when you talk about international law and reparations under international law, one of those tenets is restitution. How do you make a person? All right, we'll, we'll pick this up on the other side of the break. Back it up about 30 seconds, Shakita. 20, 30 seconds. We'll pick this up on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, WFDF. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll also give you an update on what's going on with Will Smith, Chris Rock, the Academy. Also, Will Packer is going to do an exclusive interview Friday morning on Good Morning America. We'll discuss that. We'll be back in a few minutes. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars. They close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs. Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant Capital Group. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. All right. Um, I want to go back to this clip here. This is from uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered today. He spoke with Camila Moore. Camila Moore is the chairperson of the uh, California uh, Reparations Task Force. OK, let's go back to this clip, Shakita. 11 people testified. So six of those 11 people were certified genealogists, uh, two were Greg Carr and Jessica Ann Ayuar, and the other three were Marcus Champion, who's a grassroots organizer in California and worked on AB 3121 before it was enacted. Mike Davis, who's a former assembly member in the state of California and advocated for a lineage standard. And then lastly, Kevin Brown, who um, is an Evanston resident and, and spoke against a bit about what's going on with the, re the reparations program in Evanston. So the vote ended up being five to four. Uh, so, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a very close vote. Um, what, was the re what was the issue? Why was it so contentious? Great question. So the community of eligibility discussion and debate has been kind of looming over the nine member task force since we first started meeting as early as June of 2021. So we've been having a 10 month debate around eligibility and the crux of the issue is or was um, should the eligibility standard be defined by a race based standard. So as you said in your introduction 
all black Californians being eligible for for compensation for reparations for the institution of slavery, or should it be based on a lineage standard where if you can trace your ancestry to what we decided on, an African-American descendant of a chattel enslaved person or the descendant of a free black person living in the United States prior to the end of the 19th century, then you would be eligible. And so ultimately five people on the task force uh, voted for the lineage-based standard and four voted for a race-based standard. So, so based upon that, if, some, if somebody black came to the United States in 1899, they make the cut. If they came, um, if they came in 1900, they don't make the cut. Potentially, potentially, we still have to work all those details out. But that's what it says. So how? So now here's the issue: How then are people? How are you going to prove it? How will people be able to trace it? Because what we know is, you don't necessarily have clearly defined records for people to be able to search their lineage. So how are you going to do it? So that's a really great, great question. But first, before I answer that question, I think that oftentimes people don't ask the same question about how do you prove your blackness, right? Um, and how do you measure blackness? How do you prove it? So what's to stop someone like a Rachel Dolezal or Mindy Kaling's brother, who's of Indian descent, who actually wrote a book about how he pretended to be black to get into medical school. How do you um, determine who's black and why would we be comfortable with the state making those particular determinations? But in or to answer your question about lineage tracing, um, when you talk about international law and reparations under international law, one of those tenets is restitution. How do you make a person whole after the state has harmed you? And so the state has a re responsibility if they've broken um, part of your lineage or your history, they have the duty and the responsibility to repair that. So what does that look like practically? That could look like the state subpoenaing the Mormon church for, for, for records um, and assisting people um, for, uh, for free for lineage tracing and things like that. So there's no burden or financial cost for anyone who may be eligible. So, 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 so let's actually deal with that. Um, if, if, if you, if, if that is the standard, I mean, so what, is it DNA? I mean, exactly what is it? So what, the, um, what then happens? Could you potentially have white folks saying, I've got black lineage, I qualify. That potentially could be happen could happen, but I want people to be clear that that same scenario could be happening under a race-based standard because race is a self-selecting category. Anyone can pick or select black or African-American okay. on census records. Um, and there's an example of that. For instance, Native Americans are going through this right now where there's, you know, as we know, not many Native Americans in this country, but in the 2020 census, they were overcounted because other people who are not really Native American are clicking or checking Native American on the box. So it's a really complex issue. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, look, uh, uh, look, uh, I obviously he is. And first of all, um, uh, you know, you got a variety of things going here. The state still has to decide if they're actually going to do this. And so you're, you're mm -hmm. laying out a standard here. But I do want to ask this. This is very interesting. So if we're talking about um, lineage, if we're using slavery, California didn't become a state until 1850. Mm -hmm. California wasn't a state uh, for very long before slavery ended. And so you realistically could have more black people who suffered under Jim Crow in California for longer than the number of black people who were actually in California before 1900. Right, but... Another thing, and this will come out during our process, uh, we've hired some communication firms to create a, a public education campaign because there's a lot of misunderstandings, and I wouldn't say misinformation, but just misunderstandings about the role of California and their complicity in slavery. Yes, they were admitted into the Union in 1850, but they did allow slavery in the state of California. Um, there's people like Robert Perkins, who was brought by his white slave owner 
to California during the gold rush as a slave. Um, and there's many other uh, people who, who were in that particular situation. But then also, um, two years after the state of California was admitted to the union, they enacted a Fugitive Slave Act. So um, in the event that, you know, free black people escaped to California expe expecting freedom, um, when that statute was enacted, that, you know, was one of the many ways that California was complicit in maintaining slavery, because if you were caught after that, that statute was, an enact, was enacted, you would be deported back to the southern states to be a slave. Uh, Greg Carr, you spoke uh, before the committee, share with people, what was your perspective on this and where did you side on the 5-4? Were you with the 5 or with the 4? I had to agree with Ermin Chemerinsky, with Dean Chemerinsky, who testified last month. And thank you for joining us, uh, Assistant Moore, Chair Moore. You have an impossible task, of course. And, and I said as much, and I think that I echo everything Dean Chemerinsky said. If it's between race and lineage, of course you have to pick lineage as a matter of law. We know that. Even though we know the legal challenge is going to say that lineage is a proxy for race, and they're going to be right back where we started from. <laughs> Chemerinsky <laughs> said that, too. I mean, he's, you know, he said it's under-inclusive from jump. Nobody, we're not going to be able to document everybody, even with all the resources. He said that the app, he believes that everybody should benefit, but he's thinking about what will be ultimately conf uh, upheld by the courts. And we know it's going to be strict scrutiny and narrow tail. So I guess my question, and, and by the way, uh, Roland, just to answer your question, and in that short period of time, and I agree, I was horribly miscast. I would have much rather been on the, the, the legal side trying to work through that rather than get to the point where it's an impossible choice between race and lineage, which we know legally is probably going to be about the same thing. That's what the Native Americans may, may find out. And plus, none of it allows us to remedy past discrimination as he walked through with Croson and, and so forth and, and, and the affirmative action cases. My question, uh, Madam Chair, is... How can we help people understand two things? Number one, that Pan-Africanism is not opposed to local reparations. Your presentation, which I thought was excellent yesterday with Paul Robeson and Essie Robeson and William Thompson, Pat these are black internationalists. They are Pan-Africanists in an international <laughs> form the United States doesn't recognize. How can we help people understand that, that these things work together? And then the second thing finally is, and help, help me with this, because you have an impossible task. You really do. How can we imagine beyond the constrictors that Dean Chemerinsky laid out? Because the piece that he didn't articulate is the failure of political imagination that can help us think beyond these straight jackets that we think are permanent, when in fact they're just imposed by the same judges that we just saw that Florida judge thumb his nose at because we can read the Constitution too and interpret it differently, especially since after 1965 or so. They have narrowed something that isn't in the plain language of the Constitution. How can we have a, a larger imagination for these reparation solutions in your mind? And how can we help people stop having this like it's a fight between Pan-Africanism and... Yeah. And that's a great... That's a two great points and questions. I think the first point, um, I agree. I, I think I said as much um, in my presentation. Um, Pan-Africanism and local rep reparations or lineage-based reparations are not, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. You can be a Pan-Africanist and be pro-local or lineage-based reparations. And I brought up Queen Mother Audley Moore as a historical example of that. She was a self-professed Pan-Africanist, but she also coined the term descendants of American slavery. She had an organization that she founded in California called, you know, United States Citizens of Slave Descendants. Um, right. And so she is a perfect or prime example of how you can hold, you know, solidarity with, you know, all African people or people of African descent and all oppressed groups, really, while also <coughs> maintaining the sacred political project that is reparation for the institution of slavery in these United States. Um, in terms of political imagination, you know, I do agree with you to a certain extent. And. You know, there's so much that I could probably say about that. I don't have enough time to really elaborate, but I'm all for, you know, just connecting the dots. Particularly, there's Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Let's connect. Let's connect with CARICOM. Let's connect with African Union. Let's all connect. Yes. Um, because I do believe in Black internationalism as well. Yes. Reese, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. That is a critical point. Thank you. Thank you. I need to go to clip three because we're running out of time. All right. So, um, the Good Morning America this morning had an update on what's going. Cue up clip number three from Good Morning America, please. 
um, they had an update on what's going on with Will Smith and uh, Chris Rock in the Academy. Chris Rock addresses Will Smith's slap at first comedy show since Oscars. Let's go to clip three, please. Rock broke his silence, addressing the elephant in the room right off the bat. Hey, Chris, you ready for tonight? In an audio recording released by Variety, Rock said he wasn't yet ready to wade into the controversy. Cheered on loudly by adoring fans, the warm welcome signaled a triumphant return. Rock emotional, saying his eyes were misty, though he was briefly interrupted by someone in the crowd. Most of the audience thrilled to see Rock bouncing back. I just want to see how a comedian would handle his first set after a incident like that. Now in the aftermath of the ugly incident, a new bombshell. The Academy says Will Smith was asked to leave Sunday's award show, but refused. Oscar co-host Wanda Sykes telling Ellen she still feels traumatized by what happened and the Academy allowing Smith to stay. You assault somebody, you get escorted out the building, and that's it. You know, uh, uh, but, but for them to let him continue i thought i thought it was was gross ellen also a former host agreed you don't let someone do something like that and get away with it and be rewarded as rock was taking the stage in boston more hollywood drama was unfolding in los angeles where the academy's board of governors initiated disciplinary procedures against will smith for inappropriate physical conduct abusive or threatening behavior, and compromising the integrity of the academy. Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. The board also apologizing to Chris Rock and adding, thank you for your resilience in that moment. But this morning, Rock is still not sharing details, but promising he will. hard to get over Chris Rock's composure. Miguel, just to put a fine point on it, you were inside the theater last night. You saw it and you knew what it felt like. Give us a little bit more of that. Well, Hunter, I can tell you that that muffled audio really didn't capture kind of the scene inside. Chris Rock was showered with so much love from that sold-out crowd of about a 1,000 people. I can also tell you, as I was leaving the show, you know, we were talking to folks, and one woman told me, you know, that she kind of wished Chris Rock talked a little bit more about that Will Smith incident. But another person said it seemed really classy of him to stay elevated above what happened, regardless of what happened inside. Chris Rock was certainly loved inside that room. Out there. Yeah, I'm sure. All right, Miguel Almaguer. Miguel, thank you. Yeah, certainly. All right, so um, two articles came out today from TMZ, okay? So you got one, well, actually, if we go back, uh, we back up and go back to this uh, article from Wednesday, um, October, uh, Wednesday, March 30th. 2022 that has been updated will smith i'm not going academy says he refused to leave officials uh, apoplectic okay apoplectic i should say so this this article was updated at 4 12 p.m eastern standard time on wednesday and it actually named names. Now, there, there, there are a number of different articles floating around, unnamed sources, stuff like this, right? I'm kind of leery of unnamed sources. But um, I know that th- there's conflicting information. There's articles floating around, like TMZ has the – some of the TMZ's articles conflict, okay, just to be honest with you. Well, conflict a little bit. Uh, but look at this here. Sources who were present at the Oscars tell TMZ – the two Academy officials who told Will Smith to leave were David Rue, the president of the Academy, and Dawn Hudson, the CEO of the Academy. Okay. And this is the uh, Academy of Motion, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Uh, we're told they were furious at Will Smith. 
and there was plenty of yelling and heated conversations backstage with Will Smith's rep with Will Smith's reps after the incident. As one source put it, the Academy officials were apoplectic. We're also told they told him to leave shortly after the slap. OK, now, when you get deeper into this and read it, because I read basically all these articles and I read these articles from TMZ and uh, people are circulating one that came out at seven, uh, the one that came out at uh, 8, 10 a.m. Pacific uh, Standard Time on Thursday, but not the one that came out at 722 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Thursday. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. We're going to continue for the, a few more minutes so I can break this stuff down. We'll talk about, we may talk about this on Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm, I'm there on Friday. And then uh, also on uh, the African History Network show on Sunday, we're on for two hours, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we'll definitely get into this then. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Talk to you next time. Peace. Okay, let's continue here. Um, okay, let's continue. So the, and then also the previous story I was talking about, um, read this article here from the conversation, conversation.com, the little known story of how slavery infiltrated California and the American West. This is from August 11th, 2021. And it talks about uh, uh, perhaps as many as 1,500 enslaved African Americans were forcibly transported to California between 1849 and 1861. Hundreds arrived before the state's constitutional ban on slavery went into effect in 1850, but many others came after California as um uh who is this uh robert givens california as california as robert givens realized was a free state in name only a free state in name so this is something that uh camila moore was talking a person of the california reparations task force but Slavery was minuscule, really minuscule in California in comparison to other states. But re read this article here. Okay. That's from conversation.com. Now, I just want to uh, address this quickly, and then we'll talk about this some more on uh, my show on Sunday. All right. So now this article is from Wednesday. Um March 30th, 2022 from TMZ. I don't use TMZ a whole lot, but since this was floating around, we'll, we'll look at this. We'll also look at the article from Variety as well. Um, let me look at my notes here. Okay. The update was I wanted to focus on. That update came out 4.12 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time and in name names. David Rubin the president of the Academy and Don Hudson. We look at this uh, other article here. Uh, this one here came out Thursday, uh, Thursday morning, March 31st, 7.22 a.m. Let me pull this one up. This is called Academy Never Considered Forcibly Removing Actor After Slap. Academy Never Forcibly Considered Removing Actor After Slap. Um. Let's see, let's go to this here. Got it, okay. Got to pull it up right here. This is from TMZ also. Now, one thing I noticed, I went and looked at uh, articles from NBC News from uh, March 30th, Wednesday, March 30th, NBC News that reported the academy uh, that Will Smith refer refused to leave, things like this. I looked at articles from New York Times, um, NBC News, Washington Post. Those articles 
did not update as as of me right before me coming on the show those articles did not update their reporting saying the academy lied so when i see something like that in reputable sources don't reflect something that T tmz says that that tells me there's something this there's, there's something wrong with the report they they didn't update and say the academy lied in this and and that's an anonymous source also that tmz is citing saying the academy lied but anyway and and also i checked the academy's twitter page they haven't updated anything on their twitter page all right let me go to uh where the hell is this at let me just um okay this one right here so this one came out um thursday 7 22 a.m pacific standard time I, I read it pretty much as soon as this article came out academy never considered forcibly removing actor after slap march 31st 2022 7 a.m pacific standard time so they're three hours behind eastern standard time so if we look at this very quickly here um will smith was asked to leave uh the oscars we know that but despite his refusal to leave the dolby theater after he slapped chris rock forcibly removing him was never an option tmz learned removing him was never an option tmz learned now lapd was on site but lapd was never called to intervene and forcibly remove him LAPD sources tell TMZ the cops who were inside the venue were never consulted about removing Will Smith, something we're told that would have been done if the Academy wanted him out one way or the other. All right. Now, what happens is when you research this, you see that there were one group of uh of academy leaders who wanted him removed there was another group of academy leaders who didn't want him removed and they're arguing back and forth backstage and they're arguing with will smith's representatives as we reported now that they're referring to the reporting that i just showed you from wednesday march 30th that they updated at 4 12 p.m pacific standard time as we reported academy president david rubin and academy ceo don were furious at will and there was plenty of yelling backstage with will's reps after the slap as one source described it the academy honchos were apoplectic now uh our, our sources say it didn't take long at all for the officials to make it clear they wanted will out of the auditorium the exact words used to his reps were unclear, but as we've reported, will refuse to exit. Okay. Now this is at 7:22 a.m. this morning. The Academy was buttonholed. The Academy could have buttonholed the best actor presenters and told them in advance if if Will won, simply say he's not invited on stage and then quickly say, We'll be right back uh and then they would go to commercial that did not happen and we're told the reasoning was the academy officials felt it would make a bad situation even worse the academy officials felt it would make a bad situation even worse now keep in mind you had one group of academy officials who wanted him to leave you had another group who didn't want him to leave okay so and our so tmz goes on to say and our lapd sources say the officers our lapd sources say the officers on hand not only asked chris rock immediately after the incident if you wanted to file a police report but we're told they followed up a second time and contacted chris's rep and asked again both time uh, both uh times uh cops were told chris did not want to file charges the academy is noodling 
what punishment to exact and we're told it's highly unlikely that they'll yank his anchor his his oscar the more the more likely punishment would be denying him the right to attend next year and present the best actor award okay now this reporting came from tmz at 7 22 a.m this morning academy never considered forcibly removing actor after slap all right now they ain't go back in change this and say the academy lied then go back and change this it, 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 change this and say the academy lied the article from wednesday march 30th that i just showed you that was updated 4 12 p.m they ain't go back and change that and say the academy lied now let's look at this article that came out from tmz at 8 10 a.m thursday march 31st so this so this came out uh basically it was like uh 52 uh, uh about 52 minutes 50 minutes after the uh other one okay let's look at this other one here so this is academy lied about will smith academy lied about asking him to leave sources dot 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 sources okay they're citing anonymous sources Okay, so let's look at this one. And let me pull this one up here. Just a second here. Um, okay, this one right here. Academy lied. So this one came up about 50 minutes uh, after the other one that I just showed you just came out today as well. Let's look at this one. Now, this is the one everybody's circulating around. A lot of people circulating around. They ain't circulate the, the one I just showed you. It came out 12, 7, 22 a.m. today. They circulate this one around. And most of these articles I go read, just like uh, the assertion that Will Packer asked uh will smith to stay okay and you know some people are saying oh that just came out today no they didn't come out today the article i showed you on wednesday from deadline.com that came out tuesday march 29th talks about it in there and it talks about how whoopi goldberg said that uh she agreed with will packer's decision to let will smith stay that was tuesday they ain't just come out today so this is this is the one that's floating around now once again when you go look at the reporting from new york times nbc news i looked at nbc news a number of times today even this evening they haven't updated their reporting to reflect oh the academy lied so if we look at this one here from 8 10 a.m p.m now once again it's when they say it says will smith okay now it's not saying will smith said this all right just keep in mind this not it's not a direct quote so will according to this according to sources with direct knowledge who are present they know who the sources were will smith was never asked to leave the oscars after he slapped chris rock in fact, the opposite is true. He was told by the producer, the producer's Will Packer, of the show he could stay. Okay. Well, we we found that out on Tuesday that Will Packer allegedly said that. How do we know? It's an article from Deadline.com that talked about Whoopi Goldberg that we shared here on the show. This one right here. Whoopi Goldberg on Oscar slap. There are big consequences because nobody is okay with what happened. This is from March 29, 2022, 9.02 a.m. Remember, I showed you this article yesterday. Let me pull this up here. Showed you this article on our Wednesday show, our Wednesday, March 30th show. Whoopi Goldberg on Oscar slap. There are big consequences 
nobody is okay with what happened all right and she talked up she said this on the view okay now this article is from tuesday march 29th let's look at what happened i want to zoom in here on uh will packer Where's the producer? Can we zoom in? Let's take this. Okay. Uh, Goldberg also addressed why no one appeared on stage to approach or comfort Chris Rock. While various stars, including Denzel Washington and Tyler Perry, consulted Will Smith during the first. Okay. The thing I, I also need people to know is that the reason no one got up to comfort Chris Rock is because they were going to they weren't going to let anyone else on stage. They weren't going to let anyone else on stage. There were people there for Chris. Okay. Now, uh Goldberg explained the reason producers did. Okay. So right here. She went on to say the reason people went over to Will Smith is people thought, oh, my God, is he having a having a break? Do we need to get him out? What do we need to do now? Keep in mind, Whoopi Goldberg is on the um, board of governors for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. She's on the board of governors. So she will be in the meeting April 18th when they take the vote. Uh, Goldberg explained that the reason the producers did not remove Will Smith from the event is, quote, because that would have been another 15 to 20 minute explanation about why we're taking the black man out five seconds before they're about to decide whether he's won an Oscar or not. This is Whoopi Goldberg explain, explaining this. She said, quote, I believe producer Will Packer made the right decision. OK, he said, let's get the re let's get to the rest of this so we can deal with the whole Harley. Whoopi Goldberg continued. This is not the first time craziness has happened on stage, but this is the first time we've seen anybody assault anybody on stage. OK, so. Will Packer saying, okay, let's continue. He didn't, doesn't want Will Smith ejected. We found that out on Tuesday. Now we'll probably find we'll probably find more details out on Friday morning. Okay, but we found it out on Tuesday from this article from deadline.com. This is from March 29th, 2022. Talked about this article on yesterday's show. So check this out. Whoopi Goldberg on Oscar slap, there are big consequences because nobody is okay with what happened. Now, when she says nobody, I don't think she's talking about people on social media. I have no clue what they're talk about, talking about. I think she's talking about the, uh, especially she's talking about the members of the board of governors. And as it says here in the first paragraph of this article, Whoopi Goldberg, moderator of ABC's The View, and a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Board of Governors said today that she accepts Will Smith's apology for slapping Chris Rock at the Oscars, but she added, quote, there are consequences. There are big consequences because nobody's okay with what happened. Nobody, nobody, nobody. All right, read the rest of that. Okay, so now, so we have that. Now, if we go to, back to, um this one from today at 8 10 a.m pacific standard time academy lied about asking him to leave source dot dot dot, dot sources this is based upon anonymous sources Will Smith was never asked to leave the Oscars after he slapped Chris Rock. In fact, the opposite is true. 
He was told by producer Will Packer of the show he could stay. We found that out Tuesday. This according to sources with direct knowledge who are present. As you know by now, okay, we can skip over that, okay? Wednesday, uh, as you know by now, the Academy said Wednesday they had asked Will to leave the Dolby Cent Theater after the slap, but, but he refused. Three sources who were at the ceremony, three sources who were at the ceremony and witnessed various conversations tell TMZ, quote, yes, after the slap, Academy officials were backstage with Will's rep. And there, there were heated conversations about what had gone down. We're told there was a split among officials. We're told there was a split among officials. Some did want him booted, but others did not. There are various discussions during, th there were various discussions during several commercial breaks, but they never reached a consensus. They're going back and forth arguing. OK, you got one group of academy officials that want him booted, another group that don't want him booted. They can't come to an agreement. But it's clear that um, this, the president and CEO, David Rubin and Don Hudson, it was clear that they wanted him booted. OK, now. Okay, we're told there was this. We're, we're told there. We're, we're told Will was aware there was talk about uh, asking him to leave the theater during one of the commercial breaks. We're told Oscar's producer Will Packer, African American Will Packer, walked up to Will and said, "Quote: We do not want you to leave." End quote. This is according to TMZ sources. But we found out something to that effect on Tuesday. From the article from deadline.com now will packer walked up to will smith just after 8 p.m around 35 minutes after the slap that's when he told will he could stay according to our sources will won the best actor award around five minutes later it's interesting the academy's first statement about, about the incident never mentioned will smith's name as the day went on and outrage grew, the Academy became more aggressive and went in hard on Will Smith saying he took an aggressive stance and refused to leave. Now, I'm not sure which initial initial statement because I've been on their um, Twitter page. And there was a statement going back to Monday saying that um they will launch a formal review actually detroit free press had that article we talked about it yesterday academy launches formal review after will smith slaps chris rock on the oscar stage they released a statement on monday the academy condemns the actions of mr smith at last night's show we have let me pull this up for you so uh, we talked about this yesterday. Now, this is from March 28th, Monday, March 28th, uh, 9.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it was updated March 29th, which was uh, Tuesday, okay? But if we look at this one here, Detroit Free Press picked up from the USA Today, Okay, this article here that we talked about on yesterday's show. Academy launches formal review after Will Smith slaps Chris Rock on the Oscar stage. This is from originally March 28th, Monday, March 28th, 2022. Uh, 7.18 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Detroit Free Press picked up from USA Today, the article is updated Tuesday, March 29th, 9 15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, and in the article, it has the statement from the Academy. But now the Academy, so 
Chris Rock declined to pair Will Smith slapped OK on stage, Los Angeles police confirmed. But now the Academy says it will investigate on its own, releasing a statement Monday afternoon, releasing a statement Monday afternoon that said the Academy condemns the actions of Mr. Smith at last night's show. We have officially started a formal review around the incident and we'll explore further action and consequences in accordance in accordance with our bylaws standards of conduct and california law that's a statement from monday okay all right now this uh i just want to show you this paper trail okay i just want to show you this paper trail here so you've got that So we have the one from TMZ from 7.22 a.m. Thursday morning. Then we have the one from 8.10 a.m. Thursday morning. When you go through and read and read all of them, they don't really contradict each other. When you find out that on Tuesday, uh, Will Packer asked them to stay. When we found that out, that Will Packer asked them to stay uh, Tuesday. Now, Thursday, March 31st, 2.52 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This comes out from Variety.com. Let's pull this up from Variety. Academy leaders and Will Smith discussed Oscar slap before emergency board meeting. Let's go to, okay, let's pull this one up here from Variety.com. All right, this one right here. So this came out um, today, 2.52 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, Academy leaders and Will Smith discussed Oscar slap before emergency board meeting exclusive before i be man this ass gonna kill me can we close this stuff out please um leaders of the academy of motion picture arts and sciences met with mills will smith on tuesday march 29th to discuss his attack on chris rock individuals with knowledge of the matter told variety.com academy president david rubin and ceo don hudson talked to the actor on zoom about the fallout from the assault during sunday's oscars telecast the talk lasted roughly 30 minutes according to a source Another source familiar with the meeting said only that the conversation was brief. Now, Will Smith apologized again to uh, David Rubin and CEO Don uh, Hudson. He apologized again. He expressed his awareness that there will be consequences and tried to explain why he snapped when Chris Rock made a joke about his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith's hair. We know Jada suffered, she announced in 2018, she suffered from alopecia. Okay. Alopecia is an, is, is an autoimmune disease, as we explained on Monday's show, Monday, March 28th, as we went through and, and broke down and explained alopecia can cause uh, the hair clumps of hair to fall out it can be very painful as well now at this time once again it's not clear if chris rock knew that jada had alopecia now attendees at an emergency meeting of the academy's board of governors on wednesday march 30th 
did not recall uh, David Rubin or Don Hudson mentioning their talk with Will Smith on the previous day. Following the meeting, following the meeting, the Academy announced that Smith had violated the group's code of conduct and faced suspension, expulsion, or other sanctions. Suspension, expulsion, or other sanctions. The Academy also said it asked Will Smith to leave the ceremony following the incident, but he refused. Others disputed the characterization of events with sources saying the Academy's request was not explicitly made and that producer Will Packer urged the actor to remain. This reporting from Variety came out once again at 2 at 2 52 p.m pacific standard time today a few hours after the reporting from tmz once again it talks about will packer urging him to stay but we found out tuesday from the article from, from deadline.com that will packer asked him to stay and we know that there was one faction of of uh, academy leaders who wanted him booted another faction that wanted him to stay and they're arguing back and forth with, with each other backstage Okay, the Academy also said it asked Smith to leave the ceremony following the incident, but he, but he refused. Others disputed the characterization of events with sources saying the Academy's request was not explicitly made and that producer Will Packer urged the remain variety previously reported. Variety previously reported that. Now, Will Smith went on the win. He gave a five-minute speech. It seemed like 15 minutes. Actually, I watched it live. I thought it was 15 minutes. It was only five minutes. I thought it was 15 minutes. You know, it was a good speech, but hell, I thought it was 15 minutes. In which he seemed to liken his behavior to his character, Richard Smith, father of Venus and Serena. Richard Smith, R Richard Williams, uh, defense of his daughter's tennis greats, Venus and Serena Williams. Okay, but he goes, he goes on, love will make you do crazy things. He said, to do what we do, you've got to be able to take abuse. You've got to be able to uh, have people talk crazy about you, etc. All right. Now, um, okay, we know he apologized on Monday. We know Chris Rock, that there was a fake apology floating around on social media purported to be from Chris Rock is not people. You can go to these people's social media pages. The if they put out an apology, it's going to be on their social media page. Their official social media pages with the blue check mark is going to be there. Okay, I I went to Chris Rock's Chris Rock's Instagram page, Facebook. There was no apology there. Will Smith, it's apology there. Okay, that's on their official social media platform. So people just manufacturing BS just to elevate their social media platforms, just creating fake uh apologies and then one of one of chris rock's um spokespeople came out and said that's a fake apology he has not apologized okay so there's a whole bunch of stuff just floating around we actually go through and do research as much as i can you can go through and follow a paper trail with this stuff um we'll find out more from the good morning america interview that uh, Will Packer is going to do uh, on Good Morning America um, Friday morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to definitely talk about it uh, here to separate fact from fiction. OK, to 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 separate, not deal with all this just simple Simon ass nonsense floating around, but to really separate fact from fiction and, and show you like how you can go research this stuff also. Okay, so you don't fall for a lot of this nonsense floating around. All right, now, I like to, I, I'm not a big fan of anonymous sources. So I kind of like to like hear stuff directly from the horse's mouth, so to speak, but sometimes you get good anonymous sources because people are speaking on the basis of anonymity. Other times you get anonymous sources. People just trying to just, they're just 
thirsty and they just um want to they just uh ingratiate themselves and see what they can get out of it okay but will packer is going to be on uh good morning america friday morning now there's a piece from abc news oscar producers uh, oscar producer speaks out on what happened behind the scenes right after will smith slapped chris rock this is dealing with the uh interview uh this is dealing with the interview that uh will packer did and where is that article hold on where is that from abc news We've got it. Variety has a version of this article also. Okay, let me pull this up. We've got it here up here in um, Firefox. Okay, this one right here. Because they have a uh, segment, they have a portion of the interview. So I'm going to play a portion of this interview that uh, TJ Holmes did with will packer so the academy said uh, uh okay and and then even here okay so let's look at this quickly now this came out 6 54 p.m eastern standard time thursday may 31st the article the article didn't say the academy lied Oscar producer. Now to that speaks. ABC News exclusive. The producer of the Oscars. Okay. Pause it right there. Oscar producer speaks out on what happened behind the scenes right after Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. Quote, the Academy said Will Smith refused to leave the ceremony after the incident. OK, now this is this is 6.54 p.m. Hours after TMZ came out with their two articles. This doesn't say the Academy lied. Oscar producer Will Packer is speaking out about what happened behind the scenes moments after Will Smith slapped comedian Chris Rock on stage for making a joke about Jada. Okay. In an interview with Good Morning America, Will Packer said Los Angeles police were prepared to arrest Will Smith but Chris Rock was dismissive about pressing charges. Okay, uh, in the statement, okay, we know that, we know that. This is just a very, very brief article. Will Packer, who led the show's first all-black production team at the 94th Academy Awards, told Good Morning America that he did not speak with Will Smith directly the night of the Oscars, okay? Uh, on Wednesday, the Academy uh, released a statement saying, Will Smith asked to leave the ceremony and refused. The Academy announced that its Board of Governors initiated disciplinary proceedings against Smith, quote, for violations of the Academy's standards of conduct, including inappropriate physical conduct, contact, abusive or threatening behavior, and compromising the integrity of the Academy. So hope the, the the interview with uh, Will Packer should be very revealing and it, it could uh, clear up some information that we're getting from anonymous sources. That's why I, that's why I'm leery of anonymous sources. But here is uh, this segment from uh, ABC. Now to that ABC News exclusive, the producer of the Oscars, Will Packer, speaking out for the first time about what happened after that infamous slap. And tonight, what comedian Chris Rock told an emotional crowd at his first performance since the incident. Here's ABC's Kana Whitworth. <laughs> oh, wow! Tonight, one of the producers of the Oscars revealing exclusively to ABC News exactly what happened behind the scenes moments after Will Smith slapped Chris Rock on stage for making a joke about his wife, Jada. Will Packer, who led the show's first all-black production team that night, speaking exclusively to TJ Holmes, saying the LAPD came to his office and spoke to Rock. They were saying, you know, this is battery was the word they used in that moment. They said, uh, 
we will go get him. We are prepared. We're prepared to get him right now. You can press charges. We can arrest him. You have, they were laying out the options. And as they were talking, Chris was, he was being very dismissive of those options. He was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. He was like, no, no, no. And even to the point where I said, I said, Rock, let him, let him finish. The LAPD officers finished laying out what his options were. And, um, and they said, you know, would you like us to take any action? And he said, no. He said, no. Packer telling ABC News he did not speak to Will Smith directly at all the night of the Oscars. In Boston last night, Rock addressing the incident publicly for the first time before a sold out audience, fans giving him a standing ovation. How was your weekend? In video shot from the upper balcony, the comedian telling the crowd he has not prepared any jokes about the slap. I don't have like a bunch of about what happened. I'm still kind of processing what happened. So at some point, I'll talk about this. And Wit ABC News now is working to confirm some reporting from Variety that Will Smith had a meeting earlier this week with key members from the Academy in which he apologized again. What we do know is that Will Smith will receive a 15 days notice before an official vote is taken on his violation. Wit. Kana Whitworth for us. Thank you. All right. So that is uh, from ABC News. So we'll, hope, we'll hopefully get more information. We'll hopefully get more information from uh, the interview with Good Morning America, and we'll talk about it on Sunday and try to separate fact from fiction as much as possible and not deal with sensationalism and simple Simon as nonsense. Okay. Um, hey, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App through, and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show that helps us keep doing the research. Because this is a lot of work. Helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. We're on the air six days a week. And I do uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered also on Fridays. Um, and we have the information at our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We're also celebrating our 12th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. I uh, started uh, broadcasting March 10th, 2020, uh, March 10th, 2010, uh, started broadcasting the African History Network show. So it's been uh, 12 years. So we have information at our website, um, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. We're going to post the link here. Uh, and we have the information how to listen to the show when we're on as well monday through friday 11 p.m to midnight eastern standard time sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m as well click here to listen to audio podcast download the iheart radio app search for the african history network show uh also give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like you can give us stars now also on these broadcasts i set that up today uh you should be able should be able to give us stars on facebook and where's the information here for uh right here okay cash app and paypal we've got that right there uh you can register for the online classes i teach on saturdays and sundays online history classes ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school and from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 okay so we deal with thousands of years of history um in those classes and I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. You can watch from around the world. You can use this information with your children also. Um, and even after the 10 week online class is over with, you'll still have access to the full class. OK, so you can go back in and uh, watch it as many times as you want to. So even a year from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. We have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes. For only a hundred dollars so the classes are six regularly 130 dollars we have a bundle pack you register for both classes for a hundred dollars that's a 260 dollar value if you've taken any of my online classes in the past email me at ahn show at african history network.com ahn show at african history network.com and you'll get a 50 percent uh discount also all right we have to get out of here remember at the african history network we focus on educating empowering 
and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. I'll be on Rolling March and Unfiltered on Friday. Um, and then we'll be back here live on uh, Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, the African History Network show. All right. Talk to you next time. Peace. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995, and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008, and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021 and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis' books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. iRedify is a Black-owned digital platform that showcases Black and Brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read eBooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property, and two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars, they close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as-is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs. Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant Capital Group. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The 
only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars. They close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs. Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant 